Hey, everybody. Um, so we are bouncing around a little bit here. Um, and uh, we are going to continue through the quell stuff. However, um, reason I bounced around a little bit on it was because I, um, I want to uh, do my best to introduce you guys to um, uh, irrigation systems uh, so that you guys understand the components of the systems and then the simple nuances. That's why, again, we did irrigation systems first. Um, uh, and uh, that, that includes some of the pressure stuff, okay? So I want you guys to have a, a general understanding of that before we start diving deep into irrigation. Um, and uh, the Quell curriculum uh, does look at um, uh, uh, landscaping and irrigation, landscape irrigation, um, holistically, okay? Um, and that's why <clears throat> these next two sections are very important to consider and to have an understanding of um, uh, in order to uh, have an, uh, a good irrigation system that this is why they're included. So this section is sustainable landscaping and the next section is soils. So um, uh, in a couple of other of my classes, and I, I don't think there's probably a class that I teach that I don't somehow end up talking about sustainable landscaping or um, and or soils, but um, this one is as uh, related to um, uh, irrigation. So I am going to focus um, uh, on not burning through this, but on trying to get through these uh, two sections relatively quickly uh, so that we have time to uh, uh, dedicate to uh, irrigation and the nuts and bolts of it. Um, <clears throat> really, this next piece is uh, the sustainable landscaping. And then the next video, which will be soils, um, are just incredibly important to understand um, in order to comprehensively address um, uh, uh, efficient irrigation. So sustainable landscaping. At the end of this, uh, you should be familiar with the concept of sustainable landscaping, understand the reasons for adopting sustainable landscaping, and understand key sustainable landscaping practices. So sustainable landscaping concept. Uh, sustainable landscaping is an approach to landscape design, construction, and maintenance that encompasses ecologically sound practices. One way to look at sustainable landscapes is as many watersheds that retain and clean storm water, conserve resources, and provide a healthy habitat for plants and wildlife. Sustainable landscaping is a whole systems approach, um, sounds a lot like rescape. Uh, uh, principles. Um, the focus of the Quell program is on practicing efficient irrigation and water management. These practices are key components of the landscape systems and are enhanced by the use of other sustainable landscaping practices. That's why this piece is so important, is that you can have a, let's say you had a perfect irrigation system, but you were not treating the soil and the plants and the landscape in general in a sustainable fashion, you would still have to apply more water than you would need to, um, uh, as opposed to if you are approaching the landscape in a sustainable fashion. So um, goes hand in hand, in order to conserve water, we need efficient, and good irrigation systems. And we need to take a sustainable landscape approach, um, which can um, enhance water holding capacity of certain soils. Um, it creates a lot more resiliency in the soils and in the rhizosphere of the plants um, if there is a healthy soil um, uh, life. So that's why it's so important. This uh, circular diagram here, uh, kind of, it's, it's all the um, uh, components of uh, 
uh, rescape or firm, formerly river friendly and or bay friendly landscaping, landscape locally, healthy living soils, right plant, right place, right time, conserve water, protect water and air quality, conserve energy, create and protect wildlife habitat. So why do we want to sustain uh, to landscape sustainably? Um, uh, so it is a um, issue with M. Wheelow in California. And um, uh, some states, there are no water issues. Many states, especially in the West, there are water issues. California is just notoriously um, a challenging state in terms of water uh, because we live in the Mediterranean climate. Mediterranean climates are inclined or prone to um, uh, cyclical periods of drought. And we have um, wet winters and very long, dry, hot summers, right? And we know this in Sacramento, um, uh, still hot here, uh, but um, uh, you know we'll be hitting fall soon and temperatures will begin to come down. <clears throat> Um, and in Wheelo, uh, Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance in California, um, every update that there is for M. Wheelo, we get a little bit more stringent in terms of our water budgets, which we'll talk about when we get to landscape water. And um, in addition, it, it requires that um, uh, projects that are required to go through model water efficient landscape ordinance. It requires that they, they take certain sustainable practices and implement them in the landscape. Um, you know, besides that, uh, in terms of like landscape, uh, the landscape industry, it is an opportunity to generate revenue. Um, landscape conversions, so turf conversions, um, drop tolerant conversions, they're usually relatively quick projects, quick turnaround, and if you can do them efficiently, you can make good money. Um, uh, water management is a great source of income. And then skilled maintenance is a very, very important thing, and it's not for everybody, but many people really desire really skilled maintenance, and, um, and you can charge uh, uh, a warranted higher price than I guess the normal MoGo Go companies. Beyond that, it is an aesthetic and functional upgrade. So um, there was a uh, project in the city of Santa Mar Monica, um, uh, and this one actually uh, illustrates uh, the multiple benefits of sustain sustainable landscaping. Um, additional materials are available to download uh, from the garden or garden web page. Um, uh, so it's a um, uh, City of Santa Monica garden project. And really, oops, sorry. Um, it is a, uh, a project that um, uh, looked at essentially two houses that were very, very similar to each other. Um, and uh, it's, it's looking at two different houses and two different landscapes. One obviously uh, is a traditional landscape. The other is a sustainable landscape. Now what they found um, after going through it is that the traditional landscape um, in a year's period used 57,000 gallons of water 670 pounds of yard waste were generated and there was 80 hours of maintenance that was required of this landscape. The sustainable landscape required 6,000 gallons of water to produce 250 pounds of yard waste and only required 15 hours of maintenance. Okay, so there's a huge difference there in water use, right? And that, that's why this is important when it comes to irrigation, is that um, if we can have a sustainable landscape, it lends itself better to less water being used. There's less yard waste produced. Um, and 
this is a big one for SB 1383, which was uh, put into play in 2015 or 16, um, signed by uh, Governor Brown. And uh, it required certain um, uh, uh, reductions of, in fact, a 50% reduction in green waste um, uh, uh, going to the landfill um, uh, by 2020. And then an additional 25% reduction from the 2014 um, uh, uh, measurements um, uh, by 2025. Um, we're getting there. I think, you know, people think that we've hit the initial target. Um, we'll see if we can reduce it by another um, uh, uh, um, uh, 25% by 2025. Um, the other piece here to really consider is the maintenance hours. And I know that this doesn't have much at all to do with irrigation, um, but something to think about. If it took 80 hours of maintenance on the traditional landscape, but only 15 maintenance hours on the um, sustainable landscape, think about that in terms of hours, a two-man crew. So if you have a two-man crew and it takes them 80 hours a year and they're doing it um, uh, twice a week, right? So that'd be 80 hours, not twice a week, once every two weeks. 80 hours uh, divided by two people and then divide that by uh, 26 weeks, right? That means that every two weeks they were there for one and a half hours okay now let's think about that 15 hours of maintenance well that 15 hours of maintenance that essentially this this one and a half uh, hours of maintenance for two people every two weeks forces these um these landscape professionals to be on site, to go to the site, to drive to the site every two weeks, right? 26 times a year. Now, if you have 15 hours of maintenance and you came uh, once every three months, right? So that'd be quarterly. So that would be 52 um, uh, divided by, um, well, I guess if it, Divided, I don't need to do 52, um, divided by one. Uh, so um, that'd be 12 divided by three. That's four trips per year, right? They go there four times a year and they take um, 15 hours divided by the four visits per year. That's 3.75 hours. Divide that by the two people. They're there for one, almost two hours once every three months. Now, what's the reduction there? Well, you're talking about a huge reduction in travel, right? This is a, 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 a gargantuous reduction in travel. So um, uh, that means less cars on the road, less emissions, et cetera. So um, uh, this is a, a much better way, uh, in my opinion, clearly. Um, <clears throat> Healthy living soils enable plants to thrive, hold more water, and absorb water more quickly. Uh, so increased infiltration rates. Uh, climate appropriate plants are likely to thrive. Um, cleaner waterways and oceans and groundwater recharge. So um, uh, hold on just a second. Uh, let's see. So cleaner water, um, oceans, groundwater, rivers, etc. Um, there's food and shelter for wildlife, um, reduced energy consumption, and cleaner air, right? All benefits that I think that if you're taking this class, you're interested in horticulture, you're in interested in irrigation, you're probably interested <coughs> in saving the world. And all of these things are good things for that. 
So sustainable landscaping practices. Um, this is that same cyclical uh, circle diagram. Um, these are key principles in, um, uh, in sustainable landscaping, landscape locally, healthy living soils, right plant, right place, right time, conserve water, protect water and air quality, conserve energy, and create habitat. Landscapes should be considered mini watersheds that reside within a larger watershed. Um, it begins with a site assessment. Uh, it's important to look at soil, topography, existing plants, and microclimates on a site. So you can see this uh, traditional landscape and this, you know, this is kind of an exaggeration, but this is kind of the reality of it, right? The reality of what a traditional landscape does is it puts a lot of water down. There's a lot of overspray. There's overspray onto hardscape. This all just flows right into our storm drains, which flow from that point into our waterways untreated. Okay, it's not like these, um, these storm drains here go to some special storm drain plant and the water gets cleaned up before it goes into our rivers. Well, no, it's not the case at all. In, um, in, in, uh, in these storm drains, these pipes go directly to waterways. So whatever we're putting down, um, uh, uh, whatever we're putting down on the landscape and then when water flows off the landscape, um, uh, uh, it actually flows into the storm drain systems, okay? And I think that depending on where you live, I mean, I live in a normal residential neighborhood in normal suburban California, in normal suburban America, and every morning I wake up and there's a river of water running down um, the curbing gutter from, um, I'm like at the end of like maybe, there's probably like 15 houses to the end of the cul-de-sac, maybe less, um, uh, and then I'm a couple houses from the corner and there's a storm drain just before the corner. So all of that water, right, um, flows, it gets, it's used, there's energy that goes into pressurizing it and it, it goes on to these, you know, frankly, like some of them are just gorgeous lawns, um, uh, very green, et cetera, but they're juiced up with fertilizers and there's a lot of water that goes into the curb and gutter and into the storm drain system that ends up in our waterways. So when we think of a landscape as a mini watershed, instead of just a landscape that we got to throw water down on, um, we start to think of it as something that we need to protect and we need to conserve the water that goes onto it and that we put onto it. And then we need to minimize the water that flows off of it. And any water that does flow off of it should flow off clean. Uh, it's important to understand the sources of water, how water flows and how water is used. Um, roof located at the top of this mini watershed provides a source of water when it rains. Water travels downhill, runs off impermeable surface and infiltrates into permeable surfaces. Gray water is also a valuable source of water and soil type and structure are very important to consider. Um, understanding existing plants and local plant communities. Um, doing this is really a piece of landscaping locally. Um, and it's, it's a heavy focus of sustainable landscaping. And when you think local, you think like buy at farmer's markets and shop small business and support community, right? And those are all major portions of, uh, of landscaping locally. Um, however, a really big piece of it is thinking about your local climate and utilizing plants that are either native to the area and the plant community that would have maybe existed um, where the landscape site is at some point in time, um, or utilizing plants that are climactically, is that a word? I don't think so. That are climately equivalent. It's probably not a word either, but you know what I'm talking about. So using plants that match the climate. 
So we're in Sacramento, California, okay? This is a, a warmer interior um, or inland location that has some marine influence, which is very nice. Um, uh, it is a Mediterranean climate and utilizing Mediterranean plants, i.e. plants that are from, uh, you know, one of the five Mediterranean regions in um, the world, uh, which is where we find the majority of our plants that are available in, um, in our nurseries. Um, uh, California natives, obviously, true Mediterranean basin. Um, uh, you know, the area surrounding the Mediterranean Ocean, uh, South Africa, um, uh, Central America, primarily Chile, um, and then also uh, uh, South Africa and um, uh, Western Australia, okay? These are all the Mediterranean climates of the world, and so that's where we find most of the plants that really thrive in our environment. Uh, foster healthy living soils. This is a very important piece. I'm sure that you guys have seen this type of slide before, but um, it's important to recognize that soil is a combination of minerals, air, water, organic matter, and microorganisms, okay? Um, uh, and it is the foundation of a sustainable landscape. Feed the soil, not the plant. Um, feed the soil so that the soil can feed the plant, right? So indirectly you're feeding the plant, but feed the soil is very important. Healthy living soil is teeming with bacteria, fungi, protozoa, beneficial nematodes, insects, worms, and other organisms. Um, we, in section three, we will look at that a little bit more in detail. Organic matter is an absolutely vital component, component of living soils. Um, plant and animal debris uh, uh, in various stages of decay, um, uh, living organisms, right? So this organic matter is plant and animal debris in various stages of decay, living organisms. Um, these things improve soil health, productivity, water retention capacity, and carbon sequestration, right? That second one, third one, third one, water retention capacity. Okay, so as you increase the amount of organic matter in a soil, the water retention capacity is increased as well. Recycling organic matter on site reduces the need for supplemental fertilizer application. Recycling organic matter on site reduces the need for supplemental fertilizer application. Okay. So if you can compost on site and utilize that compost and spread that, deposit that, create compost tea out of that, um, all those things, you can greatly reduce, if not eliminate, supplemental fertilizer application. There's enough nitrogen between the soil and the air for plants to thrive as long as the right bacteria are in the soil and are healthy enough and the colonies are dense enough so that they can take that nitrogen and convert it into an available nitrogen for the plant. Recycling organic matter on site, I oh, already went through that one, sorry. Um, add compost and other organic soil amendments to kickstart neglected or non-living soils. Very important. We find a lot of non-living soils and um, it's important to try to add as much uh, organic, uh, sorry, organic matter or compost um, uh, to the soil to improve the conditions. Um, if you can, retain leaf litter and plant clippings on site. Grass cycle shred leaf litter, spread it, compost it, keep it in place, keep it on site, don't move it off. Avoid tilling to protect soil structure. Sometimes, <clears throat> despite the fact that, you know, a soil, let's say a soil has no organic or very little organic matter in it, 
this as long as the soil hasn't been heavily compacted heavily disturbed etc which generally when we're looking at sites um, you know, a lot of the new sites are brand new builds and a lot of times that's imported soil um, set compacted installed etc and that is non-living non-structured soil okay but if there's soil that's been in place for a very long time typically it's developed some sort of structure to it a structured soil that doesn't have much, if any, life in it is better than a non-structured soil with little to no life in it. So in that case, you would really think hard about whether you should till the soil in order to get the organic matter in there, or if you should put the organic matter there and provide an excellent environment for the life in the soil to thrive, okay? And this is not cut and dry. It's not a yes every time or a no every time. It's a case by case basis. And it's important to recognize whether there's existing soil structure or no soil structure and whether you should till or not, okay? Mulch applied to soil surface limits water loss to evaporation, moderates soil temperature, and reduces weed seed germination. A two to four inch layer is recommended. That's what this says. When I started way back in 2003 into the industry, the industry norm was to do a two inch layer of mulch. Now required by the model water efficient landscape ordinance, you need a minimum of a three inch layer of mulch. What I do is I use a one inch layer of compost and a three inch layer of mulch. Okay, so the full profile that I have is four inches with compost being on the bottom. So soil, compost, mulch. Okay, and the, the true intent of that is to replicate a humic layer, forest floor layer. And that will typically, along with water, will start to build the life in the soil and provide an excellent habitat for the life in that soil. Uh, some air, uh, important note here, uh, keep uh, mulch away from the crown of plants and tree trunks. Uh, some areas of bare soil are recommended to provide habitat for beneficial insects. Living, so what that means really is that, you know, you see lizards and different um, insects, etc. Some of them do better um, around bare soil um, and uh, uh, instead of, you know, a thick layer of mulch. Um, so it's okay to leave some spaces completely bare, okay? Um, sometimes, you know, uh, it doesn't work for the aesthetic, but if you can find space in a landscape to leave completely bare, it is actually very good for a lot of insects and lizards. Um, uh, let's see, living green mulch can also be used to cover areas of bare soil, um, meaning, you know, um, uh, grass clippings, um, uh, um, uh, uh, ground cover, okay? So ground cover can be an excellent living green mulch. Um, uh, and there's several types, for, of course, there's several types, but, um, you know, uh, actually uh, having bare soil uh, covered with um, uh, living plant material can be an excellent habitat um, and provide excellent shelter for certain insects and lizards. Um, uh, organic mulch is an effective alternative to landscape fabric and plastic sheeting. In fact, in my opinion, it is the only alternative 
to landscape fabric and plastic sheeting, which of the two, none of them should ever be used. Sure, you can come up with a bunch of different spots where it should be used, but if we're focusing on feeding the soil and sustainable landscapes, you should never have a plastic barrier between sun, moisture, organic material, and the soil itself. Remember? Uh, maybe we haven't gotten to that yet. We haven't gotten there yet because we're not on soils yet. Um, let's see, mulch, there we go. Um, reducing or eliminating pesticides and herbicides limits human and wildlife exposure to harmful chemicals and reduces landscape input costs. Preventing soil compaction and decompacting damaged soils allows subsurface air and water flow, plant growth and water storage. So preventing soil compaction, meaning don't create areas that are always walked on, driven on, et cetera, okay? Don't create a spot where, um, where it will naturally become compacted. One really classic thing that maybe most of us can relate to is that spot where there's like a deck or a um, step down to um, uh, uh, a lawn, right? Any time that you step off of something onto a lower surface, you hit it a little bit harder. Now, if you're stepping off of a step directly onto a lawn, that is always the spot in the lawn that looks the most horrible because it's constantly compacted. So instead, put a stone there. Put something there that will reduce the compaction. Um, uh, uh, in terms of landscape construction, um, there are a lot of ways to deal with this. Um, uh, uh, your equipment access areas, your major walking pathways. You can either put down sheets of plywood to distribute the weight, or you can lay down a five inch layer of mulch and that's what you walk on so that you're not compacting that area. Um, if you're in a spot that is already compacted, Tilling may or may not be the answer. If it is not the answer, then landscape forks can do an excellent job or soil forks. Uh, essentially, it's a gargantuan, super robust um, uh, 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 pitchfork that you drive into the ground and just buckle a little bit and that just fractures the soil. And what that does is it allows some um, uh, air and water down into the soil without disrupting the soil life that may have developed already in that soil structure. Sheet mulching is an excellent way uh, to deal with fostering healthy living soils. Um, it's a quick and inexpensive approach to turf conversion. Um, it's environmentally friendly alternative to removing turf while simultaneously improving the soil. It involves composting existing turf in place. You smother turf with layers of cardboard compost and organic mulch, and it returns nutrients to the soil. So in this, this shows existing soil, existing turf. You can go over that with compost. It says compost or soil, but really go over it with some compost or compost mixed with soil, a layer of cardboard, another layer of compost, and then mulch on top of that. What that does is the cardboard prevents any lawn from coming up through that. And it also prevents any um, uh, dormant weed seeds from germinating and coming up through that. Uh, it insulates the ground and it encourages the microbial and, 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 um, uh, and worm activity in the soil. Those come up and gobble up the turf. The turf by dry weight, I think is like a 0.4% um, nitrogen. So there's some nutrients right there, okay? You're not cutting it up with a gas powered sod cutter. You're not loading it into the back of a trailer with a skid steer. You're not driving that trailer with a 
diesel truck or, or you know, 450 um, uh, Ford, I don't have anything against Fords, but um, I do have a Chevy. Um, anyways, you're not driving that stuff around. You're keeping it right in place and you're feeding that soil. Uh, it is the most effective, uh, it is most effective for cool season grasses, warm season grasses like Bermuda, um, not very effective. Okay, like you got to figure something else out. We'll go into that in different classes. Um, warm season grasses require additional intervention for sheet mulching to be effective. Uh, be careful not to till areas with species that can grow from root fragments or bulbs, i.e., um, let's see, uh, Bermuda, um, nut sedge, uh, oxalis, um, like all those nasty ones. Okay, don't do that and don't till. Um, uh, compost and mulch volume calculations. Uh, this is basically to help you figure out how much compost you need to use or how much uh, mulch you need, or sorry, mulch and compost you need to order and use. Um, there's a ton of calculators out there. I'm not going to go into this in this class. Um, foster healthy living soils. Um, the sheet mulching process, I think we already went through it. If you'd like, this thing, this um, uh, will be posted so that you can go through it. I'm not discouraging sheet mulching. I just um, want to get through this relatively quickly so we can get on to the fun stuff. This is very fun for me, but it has less to do with irrigation, um, but it is uh, making aware of the fact that we need healthy, sustainable landscapes in order to improve upon our very efficient irrigation systems. Right plant, right place, right time. Appropriate plant and landscape materials determine how much water and long-term maintenance the landscape needs. Um, we will go into section four, which provides an overview of plant water use. That is irrigation, the irrigation water section. Um, choose native or climate adapted plants. Choose non-invasive plants. So the choose the native or climate adapted plants, that's the right term for it. Earlier when I was saying climactic event, again, um, that is not what I was talking about. This, choose native or really Mediterranean adapted plants. Limit areas of turf glass, grass to planned functional areas in shapes that can be irrigated efficiently, okay? Shapes that can be irrigated efficiently. Think back to our last section, which was irrigation systems. When we were talking about um, uh, nozzles and mass precipitation rate nozzles or um, non-matched precipitation rate nozzles, you can use matched precipitation rate nozzles and they will be the most efficient nozzles that you can use for, an ear, for a turf area. However, if it is in a shape that is odd or organic, etc., inevitably there's going to be overspray. Overspray is waste, okay? So we like some organic shapes, right? Some of us more than others. But um, think about the fact that uh, if you go with an organic shape, a round shape, um, a, a, a kidney shape, a bean shape, um, a, an amoeba shape, any of those shapes are much less efficient to irrigate because inevitably, you have to have overspray, okay? So if I want to, in my designs, if I want to achieve a, an organic shape, then I will typically select a rectangle. I'll, I'll define that area of organic shape. And then within that area, I will select a rectangular area made up of two squares or a square area that is the manicured turf. The outlying areas are a nomo turf or carex or something because ultimately I want to create a, um, a lawn area or a turf area and it's okay to have turf areas, um, but make it in a shape that is very easy to efficiently irrigate. Uh, other thing here, and this does pertain to that last section that I went through with you guys, but is uh, 
a future section, right? It was the irrigation systems section. Um, maintenance such as increased mowing height and limited watering. So the increased mowing height, that's where you really need the six inch pop-up sprinklers. If you're increasing mowing height, but that mowed grass height is higher than the four inch pop-ups, then you don't have good irrigation coverage. Um, uh, utilizing edible plants, um, considering mature plant size, very important, um, uh, considering plants suited to the existing soil and plants in the appropriate seasons, or sorry, plant in the appropriate seasons. Now, when you run a landscaping business um, uh, where you're installing plants and installing irrigation, et cetera, um, uh there's seasons of the year that are yeah there's there's times of the year that um are not good to plant in right there are times when you have to plant like that uh it's not sustainable right it's not the best way to do it but understandably if you have to get stuff into the ground uh then you have to get stuff into the ground um uh, uh but do it as best you can in fact one very um, good trick is to make sure that the soil is nice and moist before you start planting it because um, uh, typically the operations are install plants, install the drip irrigation, install compost and mulch. If you can make sure that your soil is nice and moist before you put down the compost and mulch, you're in a much better situation. Um, so that last bullet point there, you guys know that I'm a, a sustainable landscape freak, but um, there's times of the year when uh, stuff has to go into the ground. Um, and uh, um, I don't 100% conform to this. Um, I don't pause things. Um, it's very challenging to do. And unfortunately, clients are not that um, patient. Uh, the piece that is the, the, the third bullet point there, Plants suited to existing soil. Don't you plant the plant's gonna know. You can't like look at the soil and go, boy, this is like super clay and super rocky, and then um, and then throw a bunch of you know plants that despise those conditions into it, right? The plant will know and you will forever be nursing it um, because of that. Try to find something that meets those conditions and thrives in those conditions. Um, apply only the amount of water required. Prune for plant health, not for plant shape. Understand plant maintenance requirements. Remove weeds. Recycle and use plant debris on site. Uh, soil management reduces need for supplemental fertilizer application. Uh, integrated pest management, um, very important piece to do. If you pick the right plant for the right place, then typically um, you have to use um, you don't have to use any kind of chemicals. Um, you have thriving plants and whatever infestations they may get are tolerable for the plant. They're strong enough to deal with it. Um, firescaping, very important. Unfortunately, I'm gonna skip through this. And as those of you guys that know me, um, firescaping is actually a very important thing to me. Um, uh, uh, and if you don't know me, I'll tell you right now, fire escaping is a very important thing to me. Um, uh, conserve water. So limit, limited water supplies highlight the importance of conserving water. Um, we know that from our first presentation, um, which was where our water comes from. Healthy living soil um, uh, to maximize water holding capacity. Uh, climate appropriate plant selection to minimize how much supplemental water is needed couple things there before I move on. Um, healthy living soil um, maximizes water holding capacity. So if you have a soil, I can't remember what the ratio is, so I'm gonna guess at it. For every one cubic foot of soil, if you increase the organic content of that soil, i.e. add compost to it, you increase that soil's water holding capacity by one and a half quarts of water. 
some of the, you guys in my other class, you guys that, that might not be perfect, but I'm pretty sure it is. Um, so what, what that's saying is um, some of our soils, uh, we'll learn more about this in our next section, um, but a lot of soils, uh, sandy soils, for instance, instance, have a very low water holding capacity. If you increase the amount of organic matter in the soil, in a sandy soil, you increase the water holding capacity of the soil. So you can actually fix soils, you can help soils, you can help your irrigation be more effective if you add organic material. Um, selecting climate appropriate plants minimizes how much supplemental water is needed. Some plants need 100% of evapotranspiration. Um, cool season turf um, uh, needs 180 to 100% of evapotranspiration. Um, low water use plants require 20 to 30% supplemental water, not 80 to 100, 20 to 30. So selecting the right plant can help you conserve water. High efficiency irrigation systems and landscape water management are both important to conserving water and are covered in detail later. Using a water meter, I think we've gone through this a fair amount, and I can't say this enough, a dedicated irrigation meter is recommended for large and non-residential landscapes. And just put them in. I don't care what size the project is. Just put in a dedicated irrigation meter. It gives you information that you cannot otherwise know. Um, capturing rainwater helps you conserve water. Redirecting downspouts to rain gardens or cisterns. Um, catch and release to recharge groundwater. Properly seal storage containers for mosquito abatement. Take additional precautions in freezing temperatures. Use gray water. Um, uh, know the state and local rules for re, uh, relating to water sources and gray water. Um, rainwater volume, this is an interesting calc here. One inch of rain falling on a 1,000 square foot roof will generate approximately 600 gallons of runoff. 600 gallons, one inch of rain, 1,000 square foot of roof, 600 gallons. That's a lot of gallons. Rainwater catchment potential equals the area in square feet times rainfall in inches times 0.62. The 0.62 is a conversion from uh, a uh, cubic inches, I think, to gallons. Cubic inches, feet to gallons, whatever, it's in there. If you wanna figure out you know, what the area of your roof is and then um, uh, excuse me, um, and then um, uh, do a conversion to figure out how much rainwater you can capture. That's the equation that you use. Um, uh, as part of a larger watershed, each landscape has an impact on the environment, right? So each landscape is with, within a large watershed. The watershed that we're in is um, uh, massive. Uh, I can't remember the, the square miles or whatever it is. But essentially, it goes to the peaks of the Sierras, north to north of Shasta, right, way the heck up there, south to uh, way south of Bakersfield, um, and then uh, everything from within that goes out through our area. It comes out through the Sacramento region. It goes out through the Delta into the San Francisco Bay, into the Pacific Ocean, okay? We are in a massive watershed. It's huge. Um, uh, uh, every landscape that we deal with is one little part of that watershed that we have control over, okay? So every small watershed can improve the greater watershed. Um, rainfall runs off impervious surfaces such as pavement and rooftops. Um, runoff can result in undesirable consequences such as increased peak flows in creeks, pollution, erosion, degraded habitat, damage to surfaces and structures. Important things to try to um, uh, do in order to protect water and air quality, slow runoff down. 
ideally store it for the future, spread it out in planters, gardens, or other permeable surfaces, sink it back into the ground, okay? Slow it, spread it, sink it, okay? That's how we keep a healthy soil and a healthy watershed. Green infrastructure is used to contain and treat stormwater at its source. Um, we talk a lot more about this in Hort 320, sustainable landscape construction. Um, direct runoff into features where it can soak into the ground, swales, rain gardens, etc. cetera, um, on a residential site. This can be as simple as like a depressed area or a lowered area, not a depressed area, but like a lowered area where any water can actually go to but ultimately there's a way for that water to get somewhere else if it completely fills up. We don't wanna flood houses, that's important. Um, we don't wanna damage property, but we do wanna slow that runoff down, spread it out and sink it into the ground. Plants and microbes clean that runoff as they use pollutants as nutrients. So a lot of those microbes and the plants, they will take those primarily the microbes. They will take those pollutants, they will gobble them up, and they will release nutrients, okay? At the same time, they're storing carbon in the ground. Permeable landscape materials, um, uh, important component of green infrastructure. So yes, permeable landscape materials are a very important component of green infrastructure. The more impermeable surface we have, the more runoff we have, the less water sinks into the soil. Uh, improve air quality by reducing the use of power equipment. Uh, remember back to that Santa Monica garden project? Well, there's far less power equipment that's required on the sustainable landscape. Plants contribute to cleaner air as they absorb air through their leaves and roots. Properly composting plant debris reduces harmful greenhouse gases such as methane. Landscapes provide essential habitat for wildlife in urban environments. In many urban environments, landscapes are the ecosystem. Wildlife need food, water, cover, space, okay? They need food to eat, they need water to survive, they need cover for protection and to be able to raise young, and they need space, okay? They need the space. So this second bullet point uh, is, is a very interesting piece in that uh, to consider in that in many urban areas, the landscapes are the only habitat left for wildlife. And that's what we take care of. Okay. That's what we're irrigating. And the more habitat there is, the more wildlife there is, the more resilient these landscapes are to drought and climactic change. A diverse landscape provides the most wildlife benefit, local native plants, uh, aesthetic and structural diversity, utilize vertical space, um, plants that bloom and fruit at different times of the year. Um, large areas of turf do not provide significant wildlife habitat. Some damage to or loss of plant material expected when using integrated pest management. Integrated pest management, you develop tolerances. Um, and sometimes you lose plants, sometimes plants get damaged. Sustainable landscapes use less energy than traditional landscapes. Um, embedded energy in potable water, collection, treatment, transport, distribution, okay? All these pieces are required. That water is collected through a watershed, it ends up in a reservoir, okay? or as we learned in our where our water comes from, that water is underground, it's being pumped out, okay? It's being collected. There's energy used to collect that water. It's then treated so that it's okay for us to drink, right? It's then transported, which isn't like that we're loading up trains full of water. We're pushing it through piping systems with energy, with pressure, which uses energy. And then it's distributed to my house. It's distributed to somebody's lawn. It's distributed to all these places. The less potable water you use, the more energy is conserved. 
Sustainable landscapes can shade buildings and hardscapes to moderate temperatures. Landscape maintenance equipment such as mowers and blowers use significant amounts of fuel, which generates pollution. Consider the useful life and embodied energy of materials used such as plant, stone, gravel, and lumber. Source materials locally. Consider using four inch pots, okay? You know how much energy goes into developing like a five gallon plant or a one gallon plant. The amount of energy put into producing a four inch pot is far less than the one gallon or the five gallon plant. Think about how much water actually has to go to that plant when it's in the containers for a long period of time. Sure, most of my clients, they say bigger is better, bring it out. And I, I really like including as much four inch pots as possible because there's less water that went into raising it. Once it's in the ground, it's not in a hot pot exposed to the sun that water evaporates out of quickly, that water is applied to and it flows through quickly because of the excellent um, soil media that was created by the nursery. Okay, so using small, smaller plant material get not only conserves water and conserves energy, but it also uh, significantly reduces um, uh, uh, but also, sorry, um, uh, uh, you end up with a much healthier plant because it starts young within that soil, within its final resting place, when it's within its final growing place. Um, as early as possible. And then it's relying on environmental factors for water. Its soil is insulated. Its soil is kept moist. There's bacteria and microbes within the soil that help to improve water holding capacities, etc. I got a little mixed up, but you get what I'm saying. Sustainable landscaping review questions. What is sustainable landscaping? Name seven sustainable landscaping practices outlined. Landscape locally, conserve energy, create habitat, etc. What does it mean to consider a landscape site as a mini watershed? We're in a giant watershed. Every single landscape that we deal with is a portion of that watershed that we have control over. We can control how much water goes off of the site and any water that goes off of the site, we can slow it, sink it, spread it, we can purify it before it goes off site. True or false, organic matter is an essential component of living soil. Heck yes, true. Um, explain the process of sheet mulching, when it might be used and why, review if you need to. Uh, why it is important to plant native or climate appropriate plants, conserve water, Suggest a practice to reduce excessive plant growth and green waste. Grass cycle. Um, true or false, drowning is a major cause of plant failure. Maybe I skipped over that one, but it's true. Using integrated pest management, um, when would pesticides be used? We burned through that, so to answer the question, um, it would be used as a very last resort after physical, biological, and cultural controls are dealt with. Name two alternatives to potable water use for landscape use, or for use in the landscape. Spray water, rainwater. Um, approximately how much runoff will one inch of rain on a 1,000 square foot roof generate? 600 gallons. Um, name some common sources of gray water. Uh, I burned through that, so you're going to have to go back and review. Uh, what is green infrastructure? Um, uh, rain gardens, um, uh, bioretention swales, bioswales, vegetated swales, um, impervious coverage, um, uh, permeable surfaces, etc. Name some of the benefits to sustainable landscaping. Increase water holding capacity, healthy soils, et cetera. Okay, I'm, I, again, I'm not um, 
I'm not burning through this one because I think it is not important. Um, I'm burning through this one so that you guys understand that there's these other elements out there that help us conserve water. Focusing on irrigation design alone works wonders. Combine that with sustainable landscape practices and it's a whole new ballgame. Okay, so this is a very important piece. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, uh, if you want to learn more about this stuff, go to rescapeca.org. Uh, that's R E S C A P E C A dot O R G. Um, there's a phenomenal amount of information on there, great trainings, et cetera. In fact, the majority of this um, presentation is based on. Um, uh, um, uh, is based on uh, Rescape principles, formerly known as river friendly and or bay friendly guidelines. Um, uh, now Rescape CA because we are all one, not we're not bay, we're not river, etc. Um, uh, anyways, this is a very important piece, uh, and you do need to consider it when you're considering water conservation. And uh, I hope you guys are all into it because it is fascinating stuff. Thank you guys.